whenever I hear somebody introduce me, I'm reminded of a foreign student that we had at Michigan State University. And he was duly impressed with the size of everything American. Been there about two weeks. And he was impressed with the size of the dairy barns in which just row upon row of cows were milked at one time. And he had been down at Oldsmobile where he'd seen these large assembly lines and everything was done in such a big way and here we had 25,000 students that somehow we were being educated and were being educated. And it was about this time when we had what we often do have and that is a tornado at East Lansing and uh, the trees were breaking off and the cars were being swept aside and he said, uh, and he said, I say, um, don't you think you really overdo ventilation in this country? <laughs> <laughs> oh, somehow or I feel that maybe you have overdone the, the um, uh, overdone the introduction, but I have a feeling you did it to give me courage, really, because the topic on which I'm to speak is so vast that it's uh, difficult to cover it. So I really do need the courage. It's one, furthermore, in which there aren't any answers. There are only certain things that we can think about and hope to explore, because in the modern world, everybody has to, to a considerable extent, work out his own answers. So I'm not going to try to even give any answers today, but like Dr. Alfenfels, I would just like to ask some questions. As I see it, there are three important aspects connected with the psychological atmosphere of learning. One of them is who are the learners? And the second one is what are they learning for? And the third one, what is the atmosphere in an institution of higher education that can somehow bridge what we get and the learners and where we hope to get them to be. So with this, I'd like to talk a little bit first about who are the learners. And I must say that I don't think I'm ever going to forgive that person who picked up my speech and um, had it <laughs> duplicated because it ruined my ability to make us sound like a fresh, spontaneous speech the next time I gave it. <laughs> So I've been forced to think up some new ideas, which maybe is a nice learning dilemma in itself, in order to give something fresh when I came down here. First of all, I would say that college students are adolescents. Now, this is no great shakes, is it? I mean, we've all said this for a long time. But what we often fail to forget is that the sheer nature of adolescence has Let's put it in a different way. The length of adolescence is related to the complexity of the adult society into which the people move. There are many societies in the world that have no periods of adolescence at all. In fact, there are some societies in which people enter their work roles prior to their even being mature sexually and physically. I've seen many uh, cow herders of six years of age in India who are going to be cow herders the rest of their lives, and maybe they're not doing it as well as they can when they get to be 13 or 14, but still the skills they are already using uh, for cow herding are available to them, and they're assuming adult roles at the age of six years of age. Even in our own society, there is a great deal of difference between the various occupations which people go into in terms of the degree of knowledge, training, <coughs> specializing, technical things that need to be known before the person can assume the adult role. 
uh, for example, if I'm going to be a uh, member of the armed forces, uh, all I have to do is to be 18 years of age, and I am, I am mature enough to do a foot soldier's job. Uh, if I'm going to be a taxi driver, I don't need a greatly lengthened uh, period of training. Uh, if I'm going to be a doctor, I do. Now these, one of the characteristics of modern society, it seems to me, is that in one sense, because of its change and its complexity, we are making all of life an adolescent period. If you think of adolescence as being that period during which one has to learn, after one is physically mature, that one has to learn an adult role. A doctor of 35 has to still be learning to keep up his roles because the sheer explosion of knowledge means that nobody can be educated once for a lifetime talking to a man from MIT the other day who told me that they figure that a PhD from MIT is good for no more than two years. This has changed our whole conception, it seems to me, of what is an institution of higher education then. Because at one time we just about came out even the between passing on the skills and knowledge which were necessary at about the time when people could get married and start their families in terms of they could keep the, the sexual urges that bother us so. I think sex is here to stay, by the way. Um, <laughs> At just about the time these came out even, and this was about the age of 21 or 22. Now we have perforce changed the whole nature of social maturity then. We have actually uh, delayed it, and I would say if anything we have made it as of necessity continuous or what Easton Rothwell calls sustained need to learn for a lifetime. Uh, one of the new things that we have, which no society has ever faced before in the history of mankind, is having close to 10 percent of our population above the age of 65 when they have to create new roles and learn new roles for these people. And many of these people are having to create their new roles. But this is no different than what's happened in every section of our society. Now, we have really delayed, or let's say, I would say, keep in going the need to learn and keep maturing throughout lifetime. But we have not yet learned how to delay physical maturity. If anything, we have made it a bit earlier. Uh, it, uh, I know that there are a lot of people who say that, gee, don't high school kids look more mature now they, than they did? When I was in high school, the answer is yes, they are, because actually the onset of female uh, menstruation has been reduced about a year, um, and this is why we're getting the eight-year-olds, uh, as Alvin Fells was talking about. We have pushed back because we're so healthy and so physically uh, well taken care of that we've actually had the onset of physical maturity reduced by about a year, particularly for women. Well, this is, uh, this is kind of uh, complicated then because we can't insist that people wait until they are completely ready for a job or an occupation or ready for adult roles we cannot keep them uh, without marrying. If we did this, nobody ever would marry, and this would be a rather startling situation. We would outdo the Irish, I guess, in that case. But 
I would, this is one of the characteristics then of college students, which they, I must say, are themselves not yet aware of because they think they are going to be somebody when they get their four years of college education. They don't know that they're just beginning to be somebody <laughs> and that what, what's happening to them now is going to go right on happening to them, that they need to learn. The second characteristic of college students, I think, is that they are value committed. And if I might repeat some of the things which I did say at, say at the at the residence uh, hall conference in Michigan, that our students come to us already committed to, at least my hunch is, already committed to the basic values of American society, and I think in some ways are even ahead of us in recognizing that they live in one world. I mean, they're quite aware of space shots and the effect of Cuba and the effect of Russia on them. But they are quite committed to the basic values of American society. Where they do differ, though, is in the particular interpretation which is considered correct. I would say that most of them come to college believing in monogamy, for example, just to take one. Uh, but some of them uh, uh, think that it's all right if one gets a divorce and remarriage, you know, one person at a time, what we call tandem monogamy. Uh, some of them, uh, uh, some of them uh, believe in monogamy, but believe it should be started at the age of 18, 16. Some of them believe in monogamy, but think it shouldn't start until 25, and they feel very firmly and strongly about this. For some of them, they believe in terms of our values uh, that Religion, some form of religion, is an important aspect of life. Most of them do believe in one God. But for some of them, they have a very fundamentalistic interpretation of this, that everything that, that all truth with respect to this is in the Bible. Others think that this belief is going ritualistically to Sunday uh, church or mass. Others of them think they're religious, uh, religiously committed because they don't go to any organized church, because they live their own Judaic Christian values in their life, and they feel this very strongly. <coughs> what I'm trying to say is that no matter what it may be, freedom of speech, freedom of action, freedom of assembly, all the uh, freedoms that we have listed, all the civil rights, they do believe in these, but they believe in a specialized interpretation. It's my freedom to have a drink at the age of 18 because after all, if I'm old enough to carry a gun, I'm old enough to drink. And another person has a different interpretation of freedom. Some of them, they believe in the two-party system, but there's only one right system, and that's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. This is in part because of the way in which our society inculcates values. Our, most of our youngsters have come from relative, I don't like to use this segregated because it usually implies Negro-white segregation, but we also economically segregated neighborhoods, social economic class. They come from high schools that have reinforced their families, which have reinforced their neighborhoods. And there is one value interpretation which is given to youngsters, and it's given in terms of black and white to these youngsters at that time. And it's inculcated in them, not something they get through experience, but it is given to them. I've often thought that uh, the reason that most of people like Sinclair Lewis had an idea about the constrictiveness of small towns was that he left it at the time most people find out that small towns aren't what parents and neighbors tell children it is 
when they're living in it. <laughs> uh, he left at about the age of 18, as I recall. Well, you well know that after you get a little bit older and you live in a small town, a lot of things are going on that children don't ever know about, and particularly adolescents. I can remember a small town I lived in in Vermilion, South Dakota, where we had a, a man keeping a woman above the local drugstore. Now, none of the youngsters knew this. None of the townspeople knew this. As far as the town people concerned, this is perfectly all right because he had done the right thing by marrying a woman who had had some physical um, disability. She was taking chemistry in high school and her face was blown off through a, an explosion. And he had gone ahead and married her and had four children. And this was no longer black and white, you see, as far as the community was concerned. He had the right to have a nice woman on the side who was pretty to look at. So that uh, uh, a lot of these things, uh, what uh, sometimes we call cupboard drinkers, you know, the vanilla bottle in the cupboard, um, which, the <laughs> which the young people don't know about, uh, uh, the school teachers who have their boiler rooms and where they smoke. Uh, because we inculcate these things and that students come to us, amazingly good students almost frighteningly good and they really get us because they are so good you know and you can't criticize them for being that good but they they do believe in these things they are committed to them and everything is in terms of black or white it's uh but these values have not come through experience but actually have come by being the ones that were clearly given to them There are some real differences in terms of young people, in terms of men and women. Uh, most of our women uh, think of themselves and uh, are thinking about marriage as being the adult role which they want to have. And many of them have the mistaken notion, which is a reflection of largely their parents in our society, that uh, if a girl's going to get married, a college education is not really important. Uh, I would say just the opposite. Uh, especially if a woman is going to be married, does she need a college education? Not the opposite. Uh, but they do feel more mature and ready to assume this adult role. And most of our young girls are fairly self-confident and know what they want. In contrast to this are men whose primary value, commitment, and decision-making at this time is with respect to an occupation, uh, are a lot more immature and tentative and insecure of knowing that they are really men. Because here they are in the process of being dependent upon a lot of others while they're trying to work out their occupational choice, which, about which they are given no choice. That is, men in our society don't have a choice as to whether or not to have an occupation, which I think is too bad. I think some of them should be able to select housewife as, as a choice. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not. I think that there are some women who might well go out in the world and work and leave the husbands home to take care of the wives and uh, to take care of the children in the house. I think it would work out fine. Just wish I could find one. <laughs> <laughs> the, as a result, part of our problems in college, it seems to me, is that these young men want a girl who can look up to them and prove that they are worthy as young men, in part because they don't have much other worthwhile kudos being given to them. Uh, and many of the girls are certainly willing to do this, and I, re I highly recommend it. Uh, but quite often these young men want somebody who isn't more than really a girl because 
who's more less imma, less mature even than he. And as a result, many of them make very poor choices in terms of what they want later on. Because one of the characteristics of our society is that although women outstrip men in terms of maturity during this late adolescent period, it is not very long until all the pressures of our society force the man to mature, to keep on maturing, to keep learning, to keep uh, taking more responsibility, and he changes into usually a highly responsible, learning, continuously learning person. But most of our society, as Dr. Alpenfels pointed out this morning, begins to depress all of this with respect to women. They take jobs which are less demanding. Uh, the husbands say anything that the little woman wants, you know, is fine. They don't, even the husbands don't put much pressure on them. And the children, they should, by the way, uh, husbands should put pressures on their wives instead of vice versa, uh, which is the way it is now. But the, uh, the women began to sink in a morass. Terman, for example, found that in the 30-year follow-up of his so-called gifted children that the men were the ones who got along. Well, now, I, I understand it's not true here, but one of our problems at the present time in many of the larger state institutions is when we begin to select on the basis of high achievement for college, we're going to get women uh, because they're the ones who conform nicely and <laughs> who get the good grades in high school and are the valedictorians and salutatorians and, and uh, get the National Merit Scholarships and all of these things. And yet it's the men, spe specifically many of the C students, who eventually become our most creative persons because they are entering a lifetime of challenge and pressure for creativity. Well, I would say then that the typical college student, when he comes at least, is stereotyped in his thinking, is rather intolerant of mediocrity, he wants his heroes to be perfect, he doesn't like phonies, he doesn't like hypocrites, he likes his people to have you know, no clay feet at all. They've got to be good, oh, so good. And he is a real conformist to the authority, the authority of a specific home, a religion, a community, or a social class. But these have not been ones that have been built up through his experience so much. Now, this is what we get, I think. Now, I may be wrong on this. I think they're perfectly charming young people. But where do we want them taken? And this is one of our real questions of modern society. To begin with, the modern world, and this has been said uh, thousands of times, is an increasingly interdependent world. In an earlier time of less change and greater stability, when a man's fate was to a large extent determined by his kin group and by the specific geographical environment in which he was, it was sufficient for him to know his mother and his father and his uncle and his grandfather and his brothers and his sisters and perhaps the neighbors, know when the rains came, when it was likely to be icy, predicting something about the weather. In the span of a very short time, in America at least, we have changed, a hundred years or so, we have changed completely from this point of view. Because now what affects us is the Van Allen radiation belt, Castro in Cuba, Russians in Russia, people in West Berlin, our mothers, our fathers, people in the South Pacific, people in China who are extending down into India. Now, all of these things are affecting. So if I want to have some control over my fate in this world, I really have to know who I am. And to know who I am in order to have some control over my fate, I have to know something about the social heritage of mankind because no longer is a man's family or a woman's family his immediate biological 
kin or even his extended kin or even his neighborhood nor his state nor his society but truly the world now you say how in the world am i going to know all of those things how can i know anything about the rains in tropical africa if i can never stick my feet in the muddy ground how can I know about the Van Allen radi radiation belt and the other side of the moon and delinquents in Harlem and people who are cutting sugar cane in Cuba and people here at Ball State and people at Michigan State? How can I know all these things, even if they do affect me? Am I not just trapped in a world I never made and over which I really have no control? This is true in one sense and yet it isn't in another sense because we have increasingly devised ways of summarizing experiences of this sort we have developed symbol systems by which we can analyze these things which do affect us and to some extent which we can affect we have developed mathematics, social sciences, natural sciences, languages, computer languages. This, these are developing. In this area, it's wide open. And it is in this area that I think that the fate of mankind rests in how to develop significant ways to summarize those things which are going to affect you in order that you have some measure of control over them. I think this is the primary reason for having students and in institutions of higher education is to learn somehow some of our new languages. I'm not expecting miracles, but having some way of analyzing our world and yet we know that in this world we can no longer be a generalist and know everything we have to be a specialist we have to as we call it sometimes pick a college major or pick a field in which we're going to be to me this is really picking that area in which the person commits himself to creativity in other words, he is picking an area which is open-ended, in which he will eventually, after conforming to a considerable extent and knowing everything that he can that is already known about this subject, he will carry it one bit further. Sometimes he doesn't arrive there until quite late. This is one of our problems, getting people to be patient, you know, until they learn enough in order to be creative. So they have to have some kind of an area in which they are then become creative. They also have to learn, it seems to me, how to creatively then depend on others to do their jobs. I really can't do anything about the Van Allen radiation belt myself. I just don't know how to even think about it. I have to begin to depend on other people to think about it. And part of a college education, it seems to me, is learning how to pick organizations, groups, ideas on which one can creatively depend for other people to do the job. I think it would be foolish, for example, for every student here in these dormitories to decide that they had to be the dietitian. I think they just have to learn to depend upon the dietitian to put out the food. It was very good, by the way. I highly recommend it. It always tastes better when you're away from home. And any food that I don't cook myself tastes good, too. But, uh, <laughs> but at any rate, we have to learn how to depend and not expect miracles from others, but we have to learn how to depend on others to do their jobs. And uh, we have a lot of kidding around about joiners in our society. But so help me, this is the only way in which we can learn how to let other people do their jobs and we depend upon them while we specialize in ours. Am I going on too long? I don't know how much time it is. 
Then we have, it seems to me, then this third one, and that is that we do live in a complex world. And don't let anybody tell you that organization isn't necessary, that it has to be. We survive luxuriantly in our society only because we have complex social organization. If we knocked out social organization in American society, over half of our people would die within a matter of weeks. We just cannot survive. And to keep a, a complex world going, we do need complex social organization. And we need people who are creative in these areas and creating new ways of looking at things and doing things as much as in any other way. Now, this is another reason why we have college students in college, so that they can learn these complex social organizations and how they can be part of them and how they can pick those to which they want to add their bit. It means that a person does live a highly segmentalized life in the sense that he has a series of roles in a series of these complex social organizations. And then the fourth characteristic, it seems to me, of the modern world is it's still lived by human beings. No matter how complex the world's gotten, no matter how highly organized it is, no matter what the explosion of knowledge, it is still lived by human beings who are essentially the same as they were thousands of years ago and as far as we can see are not likely to be different in the future. Don't read these Sunday supplement things about, you know, the future man with just a big head and a little body. No woman can bear that kind of a man. <laughs> it's just an impossibility. And in the, as these human beings are, they still do live much of their lives in areas which are very close to them with people. And my hunch is that one can be creative in mathematics, in social organization, in all of these other aspects, only if there is some degree of security and creativity within personal relationships. And I think this is one of the most crucial problems of our society, is how to give people enough security and creativity in their personal relationships with other people as persons which will free them in terms of their energy to go into these other areas where creativity is problematical. You're not sure that you're going to win in it. You're, after all, this is the very nature of creativity. We don't know if it's any good until after somebody's tried it. <laughs> and it takes a great deal of daring and courage. And most things that are creative are considered evil at first. Uh, just as I suppose you've had a lot of, what is it my, my kids call it, a lot of gas about these co-educational dorms. You know, they're evil because they're new. And you have to show that this creativity, created new kind of thing is for good afterwards. It may or may not be. I hope it will be. We, we like it at Michigan State. But we... If we don't have persons who believe in their own worth, their own importance, who can feel self-respect, all of this which we have is for nothing. If we throw away human beings, then none of these things are important. And in our society, we're throwing away a lot of human beings, the mentally ill, the aged, the schizophrenic young, we are literally throwing away. And because we live in an interdependent society, their self-destructiveness, in a sense, becomes societally destructive, just as the Mississippi riots became this. Then life is lived by these individuals who are happy and sad. Social organizations don't have any emotions. 
It's people that are sick and have the toothache and are happy and thrilled and fall in love and hate and are challenged. These are the things that we're most interested in. Well, if I'm right in all this, I'd like to turn to the middle part of my trilogy. What is the social system that hopefully gets the people that we get here, the learners, to this other kind of situation? In this sense, uh, high institution of higher education has the same aim it always has had. The only difference is that the learners have changed and the society into which they've gone has changed with the result that our institutions of higher education have to change the content of our goal. We have to help young people to become, uh, to, to solve what I call the three sphinx riddles of modern life. How to be creative conformers, how to be non-authoritarian author authorities, and how to be independent dependents. It takes all three to live in this kind of a world. And from the point of view of the students then, I see their tasks as selecting the role in which they are to be creative and our society cannot exist without their selecting these roles at your place here many of them select the teacher role the educational role as being the one in which they are going to be creative at other institutions there are other uh, kinds of roles and we have to have uh, help them to wait in this role until they have conformed enough to know what is at stake before they can even act creatively in it. This is what we call the college major. In other words, this is one of the major tasks which face our students. I think in terms of residence halls, we have to think, does our residence halls give our students time and energy to pursue this one of the major tasks which face them. Do we have areas in which they can study? And because most learning is a very lonesome thing done on, this, on one's derriere. Uh, uh, it's a almost all learning of, of this sort of, of uh, getting it into you is done rather lonesomely because these are new symbol systems which the students are bringing into themselves which they can have for later use and this is what we mean by college education is an anticipatory kind of learning that you anticipate the roles you're going to have and hopefully have at hand the material you're going to need when you actually are in the role in which, which you are creating and uh, I think this is one of the uh, tasks of the college students that the residence hall people should see as an important one. Sometimes this means simply giving the student some privacy and uh, not pressuring him for a number of other things. If he's having a great deal of difficulty getting in this task, you may have to ease up your pressures in other areas. Most of us only have so much energy and if it young person is pressured to be on the float committee or something else it may be that he needs to spend his time in this other area the second thing then that the college student has as a task is becoming aware of how he must conform to the rules of complex organizations not out of the need the psychological need to be dependent but out of the sociological need that if I depend on others I got a lot more time and energy to do a lot of other things and there is a real difference it seems to me out of conforming out of a psychological need to be dependent and conforming out of a sociological need that it's time saving if I had to do everything 
that uh, uh, it takes to raise children in the modern world, I wouldn't get any place because no person does any job alone. Behind each one of us, there are thousands of people who help us get through our day. And some things are simply easier to conform to because you just have more energy than to specialize. Uh, I, for example, uh, I believe strongly that people should drive on the right side of the road. I think this is an important uh, aspect of conforming. I don't think it's an act of creativity for a person to drive down the wrong side of the road. Uh, I think it is, uh, this is where maybe Ethel and I disagree somewhat. I think that college students should conform in dress. I think it then gives you freedom of spirit and freedom of independence of spirit if you don't have to worry about clothing. And now, I usually you can tell what school a person from. I haven't gotten a feel for this place yet. It's Saturday. But uh, at Michigan State, for example, we sell more white low-cut tennis shoes, I guess, than any place else in the nation because all our girls wear low-cut white tennis shoes and white socks. At the University of Michigan, 60 miles away, they wear black knee socks and loafers. And understand, they even has to be a certain color loafer. I think that this kind of conformity just saves an awful lot of energy. And I'm not a bit worried about this kind of conformity. And the reason is that although those students, those 50 students sitting in my class on any one day, may look very much alike, the girls all with their one neck pearl bead. And at Michigan State, of course, they wear the poofed hair. They haven't gotten the word yet that this is passe. And... <laughs> uh, because when I scratch the surface of those students, I find simply wells of nonconformity. And I think this is where we need nonconformity, is in symbolic areas and not where they have to act out everything. And this is part of becoming mature is knowing, in a sense, how to conform all these surface things because then I can have a rich life in terms of symbolic things. Now, sometimes it doesn't cover up a thing. I mean, you scratch the surface and you're to the bottom. I recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a rationalization. You, it, it's so good you don't know whether it's the real reason or not. That's what makes it a good rationalization. Well, this conformity also may cover up a lot of nothingness, but my experience has not been this. I really find that if I can get down below my students, I really am not concerned about this dress thing or even certain kind of language things. These are just symbols that enable them to carry on a private life. And in, an, in a time when we have so much pressure on us in terms of physical space, and more and more so, we cannot afford to have physical space within which to be nonconformist. We're going to have to have more psychological space in which to be nonconformist. So I, it doesn't bother me, these things, so long as we are getting at the other tasks of letting them have nice psychological independence up here. In any way, they can, you know, in their symbol, they can work out that they hate their mother and they'd like to kill her, but that isn't killing your mother. You don't have to act out all of these rebellions. And this is where we can save a lot of time in college. Well, the third thing that the task that the student has, it seems to me, is how to establish personal relationship with others in which one is treated both as a person and treats the other person as a person, not as objects. This, I think, is the greatest contribution of a living arrangement such as this, because the age at which these students are, they have been thinking of the opposite sex, sex as objects. Uh, you have, uh, we found, uh, we, I can tell you a little story up at uh, 
Michigan State, our dormitories weren't so nicely arranged as yours. The girls' wing went out this way and the boys' wing went out the other way. So the girls sat in their dorm with binoculars and the boys sat in their dorm with binoculars and looked at each other, you see, through the binoculars. And uh, there was a lot of, you know, oh, how terrible. The only thing is nothing much was done about it and it wasn't very long till the binoculars were rather sheepishly uh, hidden because these students sat with these girls and the girls sat with these fellows the next day in the dining room and in classrooms and somehow or other it just seemed terribly indecent to be spying via binoculars on objects when these objects became persons to them the next day. And I think many of our moralistic fears about co-educational residence halls are unfounded. We haven't had a panty raid at Michigan State. No, I, I don't know what happened last night. Oh. <laughs> we haven't had a panty raid at Michigan State since we've had co-educational housing. Because the boys of Case and the boys of Wilson say that, boy, just let those fellows try to come over here and raid our girls, you see. <laughs> and they take real care of these um, people. They are persons to them. They are no longer sex objects. And this is an important thing because most of their lives they will be living not with sex objects but with persons. Uh, you don't live with Marilyn Monroe. You just put her picture up, you know. But in other words, they have in this kind of a setting not only the sex object becoming a person, of which sex is only one aspect. But they are also thrown in with students who have these other characteristics I first mentioned. Persons cease being Catholics, for example, or Lutherans. They become persons, one of whose aspects is that the person is a Catholic. They become persons uh, one of whose aspects is that they uh, come from a upper social class. But you begin living with individuals and you begin losing this stereotypic reaction with which most of our students came to college. Now sometimes we substitute new kinds of stereotypes. I don't know what the school is that you compete with, but you know then everybody who goes to another school is bad. Uh, but at least in terms of your personal living every day, persons no longer are uh, a stereotype. It's like somebody asked me one time, well, would you want your son to marry a Negro? And I said, heavens to Betsy, no. But I don't want him to marry a white either. I want him to marry a person. I don't want him to marry a stereotype. Well, this is what students begin to realize when they're up against people that for, in earlier uh, groups, they in earlier relationships, before they came to college, were nothing but stereotypes to them. They find that a lot of nice people drink and a lot of not nice people drink, but that this is only one aspect of a total person. And hopefully in this relationship, we always hope for this, that they will become emotionally involved in some kind of a residence hall with a person of the opposite sex which can eventuate in a successful marriage and in the establishment of a new family. I think a very important part of going to college is picking one's new family. And I would, I would make this one of the tasks of a college student as far as possible. Is, this is part of his tasks part of the task which he has. And I, d I don't see any reason to uh, put this down at all because we know that if we reinforce one kind of an education with another person who is also educated, we have more than twice as much educational results. Whereas if we put an educated person with a non-educated person, you don't have the same kind of results. You have children, but they aren't as educated as well. 
And of course, the student's final task is putting all of these together. Now, all of this sounds rather formidable, it seems to me, uh, and uh, perhaps it is. But it isn't if we don't expect miracles from either ourselves or the youngsters. If we expect an awful lot of mistakes. Because in many ways, all kinds of creativity, as I said before, is without value until after it has been tried. And uh, we have a whole long history of people who have rebelled at something, and it turns out that their rebellion was wrong. Uh, but out of all of this, we have sometimes had new patterns. Well, we need a great ferment, it seems to me, of people trying on, not always acting out, but trying on a lot of ideas so that we can let be an atmosphere which allows these things to take place. And I would say more important than this, though, that much of our effect on these young people will depend upon the kinds of people we are. That we have them take us as persons because we take ourselves as persons. It reminds me of something, I think the most hapless invention, and I know I'm going to get a lot of criticism on this, I think the most hapless invention that we've had in a long time is the idea of models for youth. Because what this means is that a model is something above youth which they must imitate. Whereas what we really want to have is people who can work with youth to develop what they need to be as persons. In a changing world, no model can last. And it's, a, it's an important thing that each generation work out its own destiny and furthermore I find that being a model is a frightfully uh, irritating experience uh, because you feel you can only be good whereas being a person means that I can accept a lot of things about myself this is why in our resident assistants our student personnel I think that they should know themselves as persons and that other students should expect them to act as persons, not just as the one, their one role of resident assistant or whatever you might call it, that they are truly persons, that there are times when they have to sleep and times when they have to study and times when they make mistakes. And through this common working with each other as persons, directly and indirectly, I think that we can help each person to create his own destiny. And I, uh, maybe I'm wrong in this model thing. I'll take it under advisement if you tell me it shouldn't be. But I, I'm very upset with the model idea. It seems to me that it applies to ourselves that we too have to be, take our responsibility for being authorities when we have to be authorities and neither buck this up the line nor buck it down the line. It seems to me we have to do it in a non-authoritarian manner, but we have to be authorities with our, for our segment in a social system. But that our segment in the social system doesn't mean that this is my total role. That creativity comes in segments of a, of, of a, of a person and is not characteristic of his whole person. I think this is an important thing to learn. And we have ourselves, it seems to me, to be creative in our own roles in order, and also conforming, in order that those around us can see that we too are not sure of ourselves, that we're trying on things and we may make mistakes. This to me is more encouraging sometimes than others. Uh, I think we also have to learn to depend on other parts in our own social system. Just as we want our students to learn to creatively depend upon certain things for social organization, I think we have to learn to depend upon professors and learn to depend upon house, uh, what do you call it, uh, the business office, and a lot of others. And a lot of times there are disjunctures 
but these need to be worked together and part of your creative role for a student may be going through the organization and the student never sees this happen at all uh, if, and if you got any criticisms about these I think then it's important that you work it out with other parts of the organization and I think most important of all if we are truly persons ourselves we're going to have a result in our, the people we work with whether it's in residence halls like this or whether it's in, in uh, classrooms or whether it's in informal relationships or whatever it be because the easy thing about all of this is that when you stop think, thinking stereotypically and start thinking of persons it takes a lot less time and you can routinize a lot of these things. One of the interesting things on this is the sheer use of space. I have been very impressed with the sheer use of space in this dormitory, in, in this residence hall, in terms of the way in which it is used for purposes. Now, I'm sure that the students aren't necessarily aware that anybody thought this out, but it has a very creative result on the students. I think that there are times that we don't have to interact with students to make it a creative atmosphere. But I think we have to be aware at all times that they are there as persons. Well, I'm going to stop now uh, and say only that I think we're in the most exciting work that anybody has ever been faced with at a time when we really have some of the cleverest youngsters that I've ever come across. I don't know about your students, but I find college students today not apathetic, not rank conformists. I find them some of the most exciting minds, exciting ideas, which they are clever enough sometimes to cover up for people who may disagree with them. And I'm all for this. <laughs> because they do have, if you get underneath and find out what they're thinking and doing, they do have some of the cleverest ways of looking things and looking at things and seeing new relationships. And sometimes this results in pretty bad mistakes in which we have to pick up some of the pieces and not let them hurt themselves too much. But they are a very exciting group of young people to work with. And I think that if we make our own lives exciting and see our own world as exciting, they won't see youth as something they want to stay at, but will want to come on and be with us as part of the adult world.